All right, looks like we're now live for the March Ask Me Anything session. Um, I've got myself uh, set up here in the, uh, the studio upstairs, a little bit better lighting than downstairs, and it might be a little bit quieter as well. We'll see how, how it comes out. I'm just going to post a few links while I uh, wait for the questions to come in. Um, we've already got nine viewers. That's that's pretty cool. Uh, Saturdays tend to, to work better than than others. So let me uh, post in the social media stuff. Um, yeah. So uh, I'll just bring you up to speed a little bit about about myself and the month while I'm waiting for for questions to come in. So it's, it hasn't been super productive. <laughs> I've been I've been sick for about. Uh, well, the last week and a half, my wife first got a flu and uh, then, you know, I was helping to take care of her and, and do some of the things that she would usually be doing. And uh, then I got sick and we've both been trying to continue on with work, but but it's, it's kind of counterproductive. You know, we probably should have just taken days off and, and not tried to work, but I get a bit of work done. I haven't gotten that much video work done, unfortunately. Because um, at the times that I'm scheduled to do it, sometimes I'm, I'm a little bit too tired to uh, have my you know presence of mind that I need in order to, to say something relatively on track and intelligent uh, about about stuff. Uh, and you know you don't want to be low energy when you're doing it. At, at the same time, it's been kind of a cool month. I, I did have kind of a milestone. Uh, my first television appearance, very short, you know about a. Uh, all told, I think my my time it was about a minute and a half, but it's on this Ask the Expert segment uh, on uh, our local um, NBC affiliate. So that that's kind of cool. Um, I've been meaning to blog about that and the experience of going on TV, which is very different than than you know videoing yourself or doing like what we're doing right here, because uh, you got these big cameras looking at you and the lights, and and it's it's uh, yeah, it's it's a bit different. So we can talk about that if you're interested. All right. Now that I've posted this stuff, I better get over and see if people have any questions. No, not not yet. Um, doesn't look like it. Let me uh, make sure, though. Let's see if this is actually uh, going. Because there have been a few issues sometimes with YouTube and um, making sure. Oh, here we go. Let's go to the live control room. Um, been a few issues sometimes with like working all these different controls and oh man they've got new features already uh nope we don't we don't have any any yet so okay so uh, oh i misspoke there's a whole bunch of things already all right so let me start at the start canal asked do you browse dank memes um I, i'm not exactly sure what dank i think dank is like the equivalent of cool or good uh but I'm, I'm so far out of the meme culture that I don't really know. I mean, I, I see a lot of memes on Facebook and, and Twitter, um, and occasionally people even posting them in LinkedIn, um, but I, I don't spend an awful lot of time. People send me memes, which is cool. Um, I, like, I like seeing that. Um, but I, I haven't really thought that much about, um, about uh, meme culture. Oh, here, here's a good question from Carl Bad. Um, Recently, I got into a large fight with my girlfriend stemming from the fact that I refer to Cicero as Tully Ali Gibbon. She is mad at me for reasons I don't get. If I could get your stamp of approval, it would go a long way towards repairing the relationship. Well, I mean, if your girlfriend cares anything about what I have to say, that's uh, uh, quite interesting. Um, I mean, people did call Cicero Tully. Uh, it, was, it was quite common. Um, almost like a code name, you could say, uh, for people in, in the know. I mean, I see a lot of references to that in the 18th century. Um, so, I mean, this isn't the sort of thing that I, I think people ought to be fighting about. But then again, you know, if I think about some of the things I've argued about with, uh, with friends or romantic partners in the past, or uh, even my wife uh, fairly recently, um, usually they're, they're kind of irrational. So good luck with, with all of that. All right, let me take uh, Connor's questions. 
Uh, love your videos, Dr. Sadler. They're very nice uh, to hear that. Very interesting and engaging. What's your opinion of Dr. Jordan Peterson? So um, people ask me this quite, quite often. And I think that, um, you know, Peterson, um, I, I can't say that much about it because I haven't read his recent book. And I've only read like uh, little snippets of his, his past book. I've seen some of his videos and talks and stuff like that. He strikes me, here's, here's my, my sort of general impression. He strikes me as somebody who, um, and I see a lot of people who wind up in this sort of uh, situation, who in some respects was not really prepared for the fame that he has now encountered. Um, I mean, we know this from ancient philosophy that fame or glory or social reputation, whatever we want to call it, um, and, and all the other things that go along with it, wealth, access, um, but also the requirement to sort of declare yourself on one side or another on many things, um, it takes a toll on people and, and it takes some, some preparation. And um, it seems like, like because he became a darling on the right and he has all these, these people, you know, um, Essentially, he's, he's got two kinds of people involved with him, right? One, one is the group of people that are saying, oh, he's the devil, he's, he's terrible, he's a sign of everything that's wrong with, you know, whatever you want. Um, and then he's, he's also got, you know, a lot of people saying that he's the best thing since sliced bread and so brilliant and, and all of that. I think it's very difficult to keep your head when you're encountering that sort of thing. And, and you know, my impression is that He's kind of bought into this notion that he is this this uh, you know representative defender of Western culture and and all of that. I, I'll say this too that if and this goes not just for Peterson but but for so many others, um, if the idea is is that that Western culture uh, and and something traditional is what what he's defending, perhaps that's not really worth keeping. I, and, I, and I say that by way of saying that. Um, what we understand is, as like the heritage of the West or something like that tends to be much richer than what people on the right and definitely what people on the left reduce it to. Um, and that's part of why I, I don't end up taking, you know, stances like that because you ask me about, you know, so-and-so, what do you think about so-and-so's uh, philosophy, Aristotle, Plato, the Stoics, and I'll be like, well, it's complicated. You know, where would they fit in on right or left? Well, they'd be critical of both, you know. And, and I think that, that Peterson has um, sort of been, been attracted almost by a kind of uh, political gravitational force into the, the circuit of, of the right. So there, that's my, my opinion. Um, again, I, I really ought to make the time to read his stuff so that I can say something more intelligent about him. Um, that, that's, that's, that's on me for not doing that. Uh, Let's see. Canal asks, "Have you read Leo Strauss's lectures on Cicero?" I, I haven't, so I, I don't. I don't have, have anything to say about that. Oh, here's a really interesting one uh, from Corbo. Uh, do you, since you know quite a few European languages, I was wondering what your stance on Native American languages was. Should we try to keep them or revitalize them? I mean, I'm kind of a romantic in the old sense in that way, in that I, I I'm happy to see languages survive. Um, it's interesting because when I was like doing a lot of philosophy of language work and also, you know, like doing some of the groundwork for learning additional languages back in graduate school, I was looking at some of the uh, works that had been done to try to preserve Native American languages. Um, and some of them, uh, the, the, the Jesuits in particular, had played in a very important role in um, you know, coming up with grammars and stuff like that, because they had a, they had a different way of doing missions. Um, and so some of what really what you really need is you have to have like a written grammar or else it becomes very difficult to to preserve the language. Um, you also need native speakers, you know, and that's that's tough as well. Um, you know, I think just and this is European languages, not Native American languages. Uh, I think back to like my family and the fact that on my mother's side, you know, they're French Canadian and they, they spoke French at home and my mother's generation in her, uh, the house that she grew up in, you know, her mother was from Quebec. Her dad was a third generation immigrant. Um, 
but he spoke French as well. And, and uh, she didn't learn English until she was about five or so in, in grammar school. And it was um, very easy to preserve that because they lived on a block in Chicago that was almost all uh, French Canadians and, and, and Menominee Indians, a longstanding connection between the, those two groups. And, um, you know, in my generation, I, I grew up hearing French a lot and learning to speak it, you know, in kind of a half-assed way. And then, you know, she insisted that I should take like a year in, in middle school and a year in high school. But that was, of course, Parisian French. And then I, I didn't actually get serious until college. Um, and even then, I really wasn't that serious about it. It was more like, well, that's, that's what the old people talk. But it, and then it became very important as the older people started dying off. There's very few people in our family who, who actually speak French anymore, uh, who, especially who speak, you know, Quebecois. Um, and so, you know, it becomes, I, I tried to teach my daughter, but it was just too difficult to, to keep, keep it going. Um, and it's unfortunate. So, I mean, that's French. I mean, think about the, the challenges involved in keeping uh, some of the Native American languages alive in a, in a culture that, that simply doesn't reward that sort of thing. So uh, it's probably enough about that. Uh, the internet. The internet is asking me a question. That's great. General thoughts on Deleuze with or without Guattari. I think that so this will be very controversial, I'm sure. Um, I think that Deleuze is interesting, but I think that he's really, in many respects, overrated. Um, I remember when he became like very fashionable back in, in when I was just finishing up grad school, and I often see people like bringing him up. And I've read a lot of Deleuze, you know, and I, I you know, at one time I was actually like thinking about doing uh, my dissertation on Derrida. I was never attracted to Deleuze enough to do that, but but I was doing a lot with, you know, contemporary French thought. And, you know, with Deleuze, just as with Derrida, just as with Foucault, just as with, you know, other, other thinkers, I think there's a lot of people who use stuff that they get from him, but they don't really, it's very superficial. And, and I think Deleuze, you know, of course, could have been okay with that because of the whole rhizome thing and all that. But But I think, you know, most of the Deleuzeans out there, I'm, I'm very unimpressed with. Um, and, you know, the stuff that I actually liked the best by Deleuze tended to be his critical essays. Um, you know, like his, his essay, for example, on Bartleby the Scrivener or on uh, uh, the law in, in, in uh, Melville. Uh, very interesting stuff. So, yeah. Um, so, I guess. I always confuse belief, justification, and truth, and the theories of truth and theories of justifications confuses me as well. That's okay. There's a lot of, you know, different theories out there. Um, someday I actually want to write a book, you know, focused specifically on theories of truth. And I, I, I have sort of a, if you want to know my stance, and I have kind of a pluralist stance, right? I think that we need uh, multiple theories of, of truth to actually make sense of it. Uh, in an adequate way. Um, but, you know, yeah, there, it, it, gets, it gets tricky because as we're thinking about, okay, what's the nature of truth or how are we justifying things? We're doing a meta inquiry, right? Because we're trying to formulate our thoughts about that and oftentimes in relation to other people's thoughts. And at the same time, we're doing exactly that stuff, right? Um, so that's, that's, I wouldn't feel too bad about that. Um, well, here's a good question from one Mattinger. How does one become a philosopher, especially nowadays, and perhaps without academic tuition? Well, it depends on what you understand philosopher to mean. So this is actually what I got asked about on the, the, the TV interview, right? Um, we, we have this thing, well, philosophy is love of wisdom. So if you love wisdom, you're a philosopher. Well, kind of. Um, well, maybe if you go to school and you get a PhD, then you're a philosopher. Well, I have a lot of colleagues who I wouldn't actually call philosophers. I would say that they teach philosophy or you know, things like that, but, but they're, I wouldn't say that they have, you know, sort of the, the disposition of a philosopher. I think that, so philosophy is a field that is in in theory able to extend to, to everything. And it tries to, and when it, when it abandons that, 
And it, it, it tries to, you know, say, oh, no, 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 it's only about language or, oh, no, no, no. It's only about like, you know, uh, doing this, this little stuff that, that clear stuff up for science. It, it, I actually think it ceases to be philosophy. A lot of times when philosophy becomes too restrictive, it loses its, its way. Um, although I understand the attraction that people have for that. It's much more manageable. Um, you know, you become a philosopher in part. I think that, that you know, somebody like Alistair McIntyre is right. Philosophy is something like a craft. You learn it by engaging in it, by, but also by sort of retracing what others themselves have done with it. So you read Plato, not just to know what Plato had to say about stuff so you can regurgitate it later on, um, and not just so that you can advance beyond Plato and show how clever you are, but because Plato, um, even if he's wrong on a lot of stuff, at least traced out some, some fundamental paths that we want to, you know, think through. And then we can start to adapt them to new circumstances. And likewise with Aristotle. Or, and, and you don't have to feel like you have to study everybody because that's impossible these days, right? It, it, you just couldn't. There's, there's no way that you know maybe maybe even like in Hegel's time it wasn't it wasn't truly possible although he certainly gave it a, a, a shot right but after him you know there's just too many things so you 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 go at it and you you try to see you know what um, encountering other people's thought will will do with your own thought and your own life and it's an iterative process you do it over and over again and I think it's also helpful to do it with other people. Um, not necessarily like everything that you do has to be a study group or something like that, but I think it's good to get other people involved in it. And, and sometimes academic philosophy can be very good at promoting that, you know, um, but sometimes it stifles it. I've seen that in some places. All right, let me take the next one. Anna, is a, Anna of Spain, I'm starting some self-directed philosophy study watched your video on the Euthyphro after reading it and noticed you told your students there was a resolution to the dilemma, but you never said what it was. I was wondering what you were getting at there. Thanks. Love your videos. Um, yeah, so the Euthyphro dilemma, just to sort of refresh anybody who doesn't remember what that is, uh, it comes out of Plato's Euthyphro, and actually Plato has Socrates decide for one side. And it, it gets, um, you know, somewhat changed over the years. And, and it has to do with the relationship between the divine and goodness. And so one, one fork of the dilemma is to say God or the gods or whatever you conceive of as divine um, loves or commands or, or you know, whatever verb you want to substitute there, the whatever is good because it's good. So that there's some sort of standard prior to or, you know, you could take God out of the picture and say, uh, you know, God is just recognizing the goodness of, of whatever is good. The other possibility is to say, no, it works the other way around. Whatever it is that's good is good because God commands it or loves it or, you know, again, pick whatever verb you like there. And then you get something that we often call voluntarism, where the very goodness of things that are good are so because God, you know, likes it or commands it or wants it or whatever. And that seems kind of dicey because, and some people are willing to embrace that and say, yep, if God told me tomorrow that, um, you know, uh, black is white and white is black, A-okay, I'll just switch them around. If God tells me that instead of like, you know, being faithful to my wife, I should sleep with as many people as possible, I'll just do that, you know, and that becomes good. Most people are kind of uncomfortable with that, but they're also uncomfortable if they're religious believers with the notion that you've got these standards of goodness and then you can just kind of take God out of the picture. So third possibility that you see in classical theism, uh, you know, somebody like Anselm is, is really good with, with this, is that um, God, you know, is by virtue of being the divine nature, God, God already understands what is good and that flows out of the divine nature, but it's not as if God would like, you know, like Ans Anselm says, if God were to command you to lie, uh, he would no longer be God. If God were to, to you know, deliberately sin, uh, God would no longer be God. So there's an inter, the third possibility is somehow the divine nature unifies goodness and, and, and the nature of, of God. So that God isn't like obeying some external criterion or recognizing some external criterion, uh, but it's not just, well, whatever God decides, you know, 
um, suddenly becomes okay. God constrains God, you could say, in that case. Um, Caleb asks, did philosophers or ancient people talk about <coughs> synchronicity, coincidence, or anything related to fortune? Like when Zeno asked if there was anyone like Socrates to speak with Crates, was passing then? Well, they didn't use the word synchronicity. That, that's Jung who likes that sort of thing, and then people following him. But yeah, um, they, they certainly did. They often thought this was in terms of what they called providence, right? Um, things being arranged in, in a certain way by whatever, the divine fate, you know. Um, the Stoics actually had a lot of speculation about this, and, and much more than we actually have access to. Um, we know this from reading things like Cicero's On Fate or his much longer work on divination. Um, and so this is kind of a live issue back in ancient times. You know, does chance rule everything or is there some sort of underlying pattern or, or meaning? Um, so, yeah, they did, they did talk about it. Um, they didn't talk about it quite in the same way. Um, oh, here's a question from Don Juan. You have a profound grip on philosophy and possibly economics and history. Why are you not inevitably a Marxist? Um, well, so I'm glad you think I have a profound grip on philosophy. And uh, I stray into history a lot, and I do have an interest in economics, but I cannot say that I'm an expert on that. Um, I probably am much more conscious of the gaps in my education than, than my, my viewers are. Now, why am I not inevitably a Marxist? Because um, there is nothing inevitable about being a Marxist. <laughs> you know? um, I, I'm an eclectic. I, actually, there's quite a few things that I do like about Marx, um, but there's there's plenty of things where I think he's gotten things wrong. And, and I mean, we even see this within the history of Marxism, right? They have to engage in quite a bit of revision to make the Marxist theory work very well. And uh, really, if... The, the old joke about poets probably goes for Marxists. You know, what does a Marxist hate more than anything else? Another Marxist who doesn't believe exactly the same interpretation. Um, so, you know, there, that, that's, that's probably enough of an answer to that. I will mention that I've been uh, rereading George Sorrell recently, and I, I remember an interesting passage in there where he was saying, you know, Marx thought the revolution and, and you know, sort of, um, the, the proletariat would have to go this way, but why can't it also go this way into something uh, more conservative as, as well? Um, and that's, that's one of the big problems with like any sort of historical determinism. Um, it's quite difficult to do that. Uh, Sim asks, hello, Dr. Sandler. I'd like to ask, could you see yourself doing a series on philosophy of emotion? Uh, what and who and how would you recommend to read on emotion from before modern philosophy? Well, it's a good good set of questions. Yeah, I could definitely see myself doing a series on philosophy of emotion, and I, you know, I'll probably not only do a video series, but also build some some classes on that as well. Um, who would I recommend to read on emotion? Well, a lot of the classics, you know, um, Plato is is very important for that although he more raises problems and gives you answers. And then Aristotle. I mean, Rhetoric Book 2 is all about the emotions. Um, and then, you know, there's a very important discussions in, in, in many of the other works as well. Um, the Stoics had a lot to say about emotions. And by the way, there is a real, there, there are some good secondary works, you know, so like, for example, uh, Margaret Graver's book, the Sto you know, Stoicism and Emotion is, is a great place to go for that sort of stuff. We don't have quite so much from the Epicurean tradition, uh, it just in part because we don't have as many works from them preserved. Um, but we have a lot of stuff from, from the ancients. Uh, Plutarch is, is also uh, very interesting to read as well, um, you know, these middle Platonists. Um, and uh, Plutarch is kind of cool too because, you know, he's got his, his philosophical works and then he's got those lives and they, they kind of connect up with each other, right? Um, and then, you know, we can go on and on and on, you know, in, in the early Christian era, um, you know, most of my work on emotion tends to circle around emotion, <laughs> around anger, you know, um, Lactantius has this wonderful piece, uh, which is, uh, called on, on divine anger, uh, or on God's anger. And in it, he sort of like summarizes the other philosophical schools 
And then he's like, you know, doing what, what early Christians had to do, which is make sense not only of the culture that they're in, but also scriptures and, and the, the experiences that they're having. And he, he takes his best stab at that. And he ends up talking a lot more about human anger than about divine anger. Um, and it, it keeps on going. You know, there, there's a lot of great thinkers. Um, I've, done, I've done work on, you know, like Thomas Aquinas on anger, um, Augustine on anger. Um, the Philokalia has, has all sorts of interesting stuff. Uh, discussions about anger. As a matter of fact, it's one of the best uh, or most interesting translations of the thumos, right? The the middle part in Plato uh, that gets angry and is concerned with honor in between reason and, and the appetites is the incandescent part. I've seen that as a, a nice translation in the, the, the English uh, version of the Philokalia. Um, and then, you know, it continues on into modern philosophy. There's some really great works in modern philosophy, like Descartes' Treatise on the Passions of the Soul, uh, written in response to Princess Elizabeth. Uh, so, yeah, there's, 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 there's a lot of good stuff there. Uh, Richler, I started reading Simone de Beauvoir's The Second Sex, and I was wondering if you're planning to make more videos about her or other feminist thinkers. Uh, yeah, I, 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 one thing I've, I've meant to do for a long time, and I put it as one of the, like, goals that I'll, I'll take on when I reach a certain level of support in Patreon is to restart that existentialism series that I started so long ago. And de Beauvoir, um, I'll definitely be doing parts of the second sex and uh, the ethics of ambiguity. And, um, you know, I might, I might do, um, uh, one, you know, one of her literary works as well. And I have done uh, videos on, on other feminist thinkers. You know, somebody who I, I work on quite a bit is Mary Wollstonecraft. Um, so, you know, you, you've got, I think, at this point, seven or eight videos I've done on her, uh, All you know, some of which are for classes, some of which are for talks. Um, I mean, who else? Uh, you know, Hannah, Hannah Rent is not, I don't think she'd you know, classify herself as a feminist, but she's definitely, um, you know, very interesting thinker. And, and yeah, I, I, I do that. It's interesting because when I posted one of my Wollstonecraft talks, even before anybody had actually watched it, because this is within a minute of posting it, I got two different responses, both from opposite ends of the spectrum. One was from a woman who said, oh, typical, you know, middle-aged white male talking about, you know, women trying to claim her for his own and all that and of course she hadn't watched the talk she just reacted to the fact that i am indeed a middle-aged white man you know <laughs> who's talking about wollstonecraft and on the other end there is some you know alt-right kid who was you know on and on about you know women can't be philosophers blah 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 and you know uh it's really too too bad you know that that neither of them even bothered to hear what what what, what was being said Oh, wow. A lot, of, a lot more questions coming up. Zooming through. Uh, let me grab one by Nature Boy. Do you follow a certain philosophy in your own life? Yeah, I, I do. I, I, um, I'm an eclectic, you know. I draw upon different philosophical traditions. Those that I draw upon the most would be, you know, the Aristotelian and the Stoic and, and the broad Platonist tradition, some Christian writers, um, existentialists, and um, I would say, you know, I draw on some stuff from the psychoanalytic tradition rather selectively, and some stuff from the dialectical tradition as well. Um, Ashley writes, "Hope you and your wife feel better soon." Thanks. That, that's that's uh, very nice of you. Uh, yeah, you get these flu bugs, um, you know, and we're in an era when when I think sicknesses are going to get worse you know, because we've made so many things. Uh, resistant. Um, Wilhelm, why do you find monotheism to be more philosophically cogent than polytheism? I'm not, I'm not sure I ever said it was more philosophically cogent, but I, I, I do. Um, I mean, in a way, you know, you, you could say that there's, there's, um, there's monotheism in, in a lot of different senses. You know, I particularly like um, these, these thinkers like Chesterton or Lewis, uh, the writer, also the, you know, Kamoesh, the, the writer of the Lushadadish, who are able to take, you know, sort of the, the, the 
pagan polytheistic mess of gods and somehow assimilate them into a monotheistic context. Similar to what's done in Ife religion too, by the way, you know, where you've got Olorun and then you've got the Orisa who are the, the deputies, right? We see this over and over and over again, this, this thematic. The Stoics also had something kind of similar to that. There was God, Zeus, and then there were the gods and they helped to, you know, to, to take care of the universe. Um, you know, I, I think that that um, although it's fun to read, you know, the, the ancient myths and stuff like that, the notion of, of uh, the universe being a portion between fundamentally uh, opposed beings, uh, who none of whom actually are like on top of everything. I, you know, I think if you're going to have a God, a divine principle in there, may as well make it, you know, capital G uh, God in a way. And, I, and that's not a great argument there, but um, that's just sort of touching on it. But I mean, you're, you're talking about something that would take a much longer time to discuss. Uh, Trevor, if determinism is choice, what would be a great way to move the zeitgeist forward? The goal to move as much human diversity into the future as possible. Big projects, multi-planetary living. I don't know what if determinism is choice would mean. Um, I mean, are you talking about a compatibilism where we where we... We, we work within a determinism, but we, we contribute to that determinism and sort of every once in a while kind of it, it, it add something new to it. Um, well, I think we could, you know, put that aside and then talk about how do we move the zeitgeist forward to move as much human diversity in the future as possible. Um, I guess that's a good thing. I mean, a lot of human diversity is diversity of how, how, how screwed up people are. So maybe we'd want to prune some of that off, you know. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it, it depends on what we're, we're talking about in terms of diversity, right? Um, and I would, I would love to see us reach out to the stars, but I, I, don't, I don't foresee that happening in our lifetime. You know, it's interesting because I was born uh, in 1970, and, and um, the fact that we'd landed on the moon was really, really big news. And I wanted to be an astronaut when I was, like, four or five, six years old. And, you know, I remember like how slow everything went. And, you know, I remember the, the Challenger explosion, we were watching it on television in our classroom and um, realizing that whatever was going to happen in terms of mankind and the stars was not going to be like the sci-fi stuff that we, we had. Um, all right, let me go down. Um, Oh, here's a good question from Carl. Recently in your Ideas That Matter video, you and your <coughs> interlocutor while discussing Santayana referenced non-reductive materialism. Can you explain this concept further? Yeah, so non-reductive materialism is exactly what it sounds like. You say that everything is material, but you don't try to say, well, whatever doesn't neatly fit into whatever materialist schema we've got is all BS. So it, it means that you're challenged. It means that if you want to be a thoroughgoing materialist, then you need to be, let's, let's sort of bring in another guy, William James, right? William James says the empiricists were not empirical enough. Empiricism is about experience. And if your empiricism is too rigid, you can't account for a lot of the experiences that people have other than saying, oh, that's all illusion or they, they don't know what they're talking about. And when you do that, you have an impoverished world that you're, you're projecting onto there. Um, if materialism is really any good, it's got to be able to explain and not just explain away why people would talk about, say, spiritual realities. Hegel is somebody who does that, by the way, um, in the phenomenology. Over and over and over again, Hegel will say, ideas matter insofar as you can put them into some sort of actuality. That's where, you know, he doesn't say this, but that's where the proverbial rubber meets the road. But you got to have the whole of the idea, not just, you know, whatever fit into a nice little, little uh, box. Um, Adam, how fast do you read books? How to develop speed reading? I don't speed read. Um, I think speed reading is, is nonsense. Um, you know, it could be good for technical stuff. It's, it's not worth doing for philosophy because philosophy and anything else that's like it, you know, thoughtful history, uh, thoughtful political science, thoughtful economics. You need to actually slow down and think, and you can't force ideas. You have to actually grow with them. 
Um, how fast do I read books? Depends on the books. So if it's a work of philosophy, oftentimes I'm rereading rather than reading these days. And I also have, you know, um, some advantage in that I can draw on a lot of background knowledge and previous experience, but I, I take philosophy books pretty slow. Um, if it's a novel, I'll probably read it pretty fast, you know, um, because it's not demanding quite so much of me, unless the writing is extraordinarily good or it's very philosophically astute or something like that. So Riley, hi, Dr. Sadler. What's your most important piece of advice for writing a good philosophy paper? That's a tough one. <laughs> So I'll give you the bit of advice that one of my dissertation advisors gave me. The only good dissertation is a done dissertation. Don't be a perfectionist. Um, you can always rewrite. You can always add later on. Um, but what's most important is actually getting something out there, externalized rather, rather than going down a million rabbit holes of research, you know, um, or, or worrying about it too much. Um, Lana asks, how do we know that we understand the real meaning of philosophical propositions and that we're not confused linguistically and epistemologically? When do we know we're getting the real meaning? I'm not even sure how, how you would, you would answer that. Um, I suppose it's kind of an approximative process, you know, it's, it's not something I, I think about too much. I mean, th it is a really good question. How do we know that we don't have sort of systematic biases that are messing us up? We, we really only realize that when we, you know, run into something like here, here would be an example of how it could happen. You're reading, you're reading something and you're like, this doesn't seem right at all. I mean, why would somebody who I think is pretty intelligent write this crazy crap? And you're like, well, maybe, maybe I'm getting the words wrong. Maybe, Maybe I need to look at look at this more carefully, and then maybe you go to secondary literature to 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 find out about it. You know, I mean, this happens all the time with the half hour Hegel project and the videos, right? People are like, you know, Hegel said this and that. And I actually got the book right here. You know, uh, so Miller's translation of Hegel says blah 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 blah, and you know, and you're like, well, I mean, Miller's trying to translate something that's rather difficult. Hegel's prose is not easy. He was not a great stylist. Um, and he's trying to grapple with some really complicated ideas. So don't automatically take this word to mean what you think it means in a non-philosophical context and then, you know, just sort of deduce things from it. Um, it usually takes those kind of experiences where we become aware. And then you just, I don't know, you just keep working at it. Um, Will asks, uh, you got a lot of lectures on the Stoics. What's your take on Spinoza and the Stoics? Is Spinoza just a different flavor of the Stoics? You know, one of Spinoza's earliest books is Principles of Cartesian Philosophy. Spinoza is a Cartesian. He's not, he's not actually a Stoic. You could say he's influenced in a certain respect by Neo-Stoicism, but no, he's doing his own thing. Um, and and uh, he's using Cartesian stuff at the beginning and also some stuff he borrows from Hobbes too and the Tractatus Theologico Politicus. Um, but he's really, he's really doing his own thing. Um, he, he's, he's, I, I don't think his pantheism is really that similar to that of the Stoics. I mean, there is a similar emphasis on, on trying to understand the emotions, but um, you know, the idea that he has of the emotions is not a Stoic one, I would say. Um, all right. Um, Lyndon, very late starter, but I just started reading The Republic. I'm kind of amused at how some of the arguments sound a bit like sophistry. Yeah, and, and there, there's like two ways that happens, right? Uh, it's, it's somebody who's not Socrates making a bad argument, sometimes actually saying, like Glaucon does in book two, I don't believe this argument myself, Socrates, but I want to see how you respond to it. Let me put it out there, right? Um, and sometimes it's Socrates. And so you can ask yourself, well, why would Plato, who, who was a smart guy, um, have his favorite guy, his teacher, saying things that, you know, a little bit of analysis could reveal to have weaknesses? And so maybe it's like Plato creating an obstacle course for us. Maybe we're supposed to be in dialogue with the dialogues and, and go a little bit further beyond them. I mean, that would fit Plato's view on the written word. So, yeah. Um, let's see here. 
I can't I can't read Chinese anymore, so I, I, I have no idea what, what name that is. How to learn ancient Greek for Chinese. It is extremely difficult for me. Um, I don't know if I have any any advice that would be particularly helpful for that. Um, I just don't, you know, I don't know the, the field well enough. Uh, one Matt Yinger, would you say going to vote on national elections is a duty and obligation of a citizen? If so, why? Um, yeah, I think it's, I think it's a duty and obligation, but it's, it's kind of mitigated by the fact that we don't really have a hell of a lot of choice in, in some circumstances. I mean, are, are, were, were Russians obligated to go to the polls, uh, when you know, Putin is pretty much going to win. Um, you know, there's a big debate about this. Should, you know, should you not vote because that way you're not, you know, ratifying, an election that you really can't believe in, or should you cast a protest vote for one of the other candidates? This is a big problem here as well. Something that, um, you know, uh, important philosophers have, have actually taken stands on. I mean, I got into some, some discussions with uh, Paul Griffiths uh, back in the Bush era about exactly, you know, how one ought to be voting or casting a principled non-vote, as Alistair McIntyre called it. You know, what, what should we be doing? Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of a, you know, it's an interesting point. I'm happy that here in Wisconsin, in my state, um, I am, you know, in, instead of like living in New York where I actually registered as a Republican, um, not because I like the Republican party, but because I wanted to have a, a, a little bit of a vote that counted, you know, like in the, the primaries, cause they don't have open primaries and the democratic machine runs pretty much to everything they want there. Um, here in Wisconsin, we have open primaries, which means that you can be a registered independent like I am, and you get to vote in the Republican one or the Democrat one. You get to pick and choose. And uh, we're a battleground state. You know, our votes actually count. Whereas if you live in Illinois, to the south of us, not really. You know, it's a blue state, and it's probably going to stay blue the whole time. Or if you went a little bit further south, you got red states that are just going to stay red, you know. Um, in, in cases like that, it, maybe it doesn't matter if you vote, you know. So that's that's something to think about. Uh, Ing, Ingildze, I, I'm sure I've mispronounced that. I wonder how you're not losing your voice. Well, that's an interesting point. Uh, I guess it's like a muscle, right? You use it a lot and uh, you'll be okay with it. Um, I remember when I was teaching in the prisons, when I first started teaching, I would sometimes have, I, I would, I would drink tea and I would have these, uh, cough drops and I'd bring them along every single day because, um, <clears throat> by the end of the day, I'd been, you know, not just talking in the classroom, but usually having to shout over fans, you know, air conditioners, stuff like that for about seven to eight hours. And my vocal cords were actually like sore you know, by, by the end of the day where I could barely talk. So, uh, who says, is there a proper email address for you? Yep. Uh, Greg at reason com. easy enough to find. It's like on my YouTube, it's on my Facebook, it's everywhere. Um, catalogus catching a live stream of yours is incredibly exciting. Glad that you, you, you feel that way. Um, JJS, what is your view on postmodernism? I think most people who talk about postmodernism don't have any idea what they're talking about, both the people who are like for postmodernism and the people who are against it. I don't take anybody very seriously unless they actually have can you know show me that they 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 know something about you know the the now traditional use of the term. Um, if it's just like, well, you know. Uh, relativism, just call it relativism. Don't call it postmodernism because relativism has been around uh, since the, the ancient period, right? There's nothing particularly postmodern about it. Um, you know, a lot of people use it as kind of a boogeyman, um, but, you know, that's just a sign of, I don't know, either they, they don't know or they're opportunistically trying to rile people up. Um, what do I, this is Adario, what do I think of Noam Chomsky, Chomsky's political views? I pretty much ignore Noam Chomsky. I know, I, I know generally where he's going to, uh, come from the, I mean, I do agree with him, uh, about the fact that we have way too much influence 
by corporations in in the way that our governments work and in our daily lives and stuff like that. But I'm not I'm not a far leftist like him, so um, <coughs> you know I I think that. Um, Interestingly, I, I actually think that his, his uh, political stuff is more interesting than his linguistic stuff because his linguistic stuff, back when I was doing philosophy of language, I just never found it interesting at all. Um, you know, I, I read it, but you know, I, I, didn't, I didn't see it as revolutionary or anything like that. Catalogus, will you delve into capital in the future? Um, David Harvey's already done that. There's, there's no need for, for me to go into... Uh, Capital. He's got a great video series on it. He's the only other person out there doing something like the Half Hour Hegel series. So I think that's that's great. Uh, Bridget, Thomism solves many metaphysical and epistemological problems by appealing to the matter-form distinction. But is it possible to defend the formulation of matter-form in the first place? For instance, how can a Thomist argue against idealism without first taking it for granted, this fragmenting of reality into matter and form? That is at such a high level of abstraction that um, I, I wouldn't even know how, how to answer it. Because, I mean, when somebody says Thomism, I always ask, okay, who's Thomism? Uh, are you, like, actually going to the Summa and working from that? Are you reading Garigou Lagrange? Are you reading Jacques Moratin? Are you, you know, using Alistair McIntyre? Very, very different kinds of Thomism. And so I'm very uh, leery of any generalization about Thomism, you know, uh, as such. Um, they do, in fact, I wouldn't say they solve many metaphysical and epistemological problems. They provide explanations uh, of things that are identified as problems by using, not just appealing, but using the matter-form distinction. It's only effective if you can actually parse it out. Um, and is it possible to defend the formulation of matter-form in the first place? Sure. I mean, there are defenses of that. Um, you know, again, Thomas literature, right? Uh uh, you know, you can read people's discussions of that. And and plenty of Thomas took on idealism, you know, uh, within, I mean, transcendental Thomism would be a place to go. Read Rahner, you know, Marshall, people like that, if that's that's what you're into. Um, they certainly were engaged with, with idealism. Um, I mean, you don't really fragment reality into matter and form because they're not, it's not as if you ever have prime matter anyway that's totally uninformed. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a way of analyzing things. Oh, here's a good one from Koha. My question is, what age did you first approach to philosophy and which one is the most advisable for a newcomer to get started? So I'll answer the second part first. You can start philosophy whenever. Um, I mean, starting philosophy is not something that you have to be anxious about getting right. Um, you're inevitably going to read something that later on you're like, oh, I read the wrong thing, you know. Uh, just start reading some stuff and, and thinking about it and discussing it with other people. Um, whether it's Plato or whether it's contemporary stuff or whether it's medieval thinkers or, you know, any, anything in between. Um, I first encountered philosophy as taught as philosophy in a philosophy class that I hated in high school. Uh, and then encountered it in a religion class, not being taught as philosophy, um, uh, taught by a substitute teacher, and I really enjoyed it. And I was, you know, I was reading, you know, bits and pieces of things, some Eastern thought. You know, I was very interested in history, so of course I'd, I'd paid attention uh, to, to some things in Western philosophy, but didn't understand them that well. And, you know, even as an undergraduate, I, I you know, I didn't have very good teachers, um, so that's one thing, but I also read very, you know, eclectically. So, you know, uh, my, my path is not the path I think everybody should, should tread. Uh, Retro Gamer is, is trying to like, uh, stir things up. God loves libertarianism. Uh, I've never seen a, uh, you know, a scripture that said that, um, and I don't, I don't presume to understand the mind of God. But, I mean, it could be the case, but I, I highly doubt it. <laughs> you know? uh, Rakid, uh, any thoughts on postmodernism and its emphasis on identity politics that resonates with contemporary left-wing fascination with identity? Yeah, it's not postmodern. Identity politics and postmodernism are not the same thing. Um, you know, they're, they're glommed together in the popular mind, 
Uh, and I'd say that the, the right wing is just as fascinated with identity politics as the left wing are. It's just different identities that they're, they're focused on. Uh, Trevor asks about, about my Myers-Briggs thing. I've never done a Myers-Briggs thing. I think Myers-Briggs is bullshit. Um, you know, any, any classificatory principle like that, uh, I don't, I don't buy into. Um, and, uh, you know, people make use of those for all sorts of silly generalizations. I, I, I have no idea what I would actually score, but I don't put any stock in it at all. And, and, and you know, this is kind of a, a running joke among people who do coaching or counseling or stuff like that, you know, how, how unscientific the Myers-Briggs stuff is, but how much people seem to love it, you know, especially in business formats and, and pastoral formats. All right, Sherry, are you concerned about what Islam is doing to the world, people who say they believe in God, but their actions tell their nihilists? Yeah, I, I've been concerned about that for a very long time. Um, I think that that there, there is a good bit of that in, uh, you know, what we call radical Islam or totalitarian Islam. Um, I, don't, I don't really like the word Islamofascism uh, because I think that what goes on in totalitarian Islam um, is, is a bit different and a bit more difficult to combat. Than, than just plain old you know garden variety fascism in part because it's got it's got deeper roots. Um, that said, um, I don't I don't see that as as sort of you know the face of Islam, right? Um, and I haven't uh, really the entire time that I've been interested in in, in these issues, which long which went you know long before 9/11. Um, and there's plenty of other people who believe in God and are nihilists as well. Uh, there's plenty of, of uh, Christians I've seen doing that. And I'd say some of the people involved in the Hindutva movement uh, in, in contemporary India um, are, are doing that as well. Buddhists who are engaging in ethnic cleansing in Burma, likewise. You know, So it's not as if Islam has a monopoly on that. Uh, and if we look through our history, you know, we can see some pretty horrific stuff carried out in the West um, that, that said, uh, it's not as if religious people have a monopoly on that either. Plenty of secularists as well. So, all right. Uh, Eog, what is your opinion on Epicureanism as a philosophy of life? That's an interesting one. So we don't really have that much to work with, right? Uh, from ancient Epicureanism, we have um, a few writings by Epicurus that are preserved by Diogenes Laertes in his Lives of the Philosophers. Thank God for that, because otherwise we wouldn't have any of that. Um, we do have the Vatican sayings, you know, which 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 complement that. Uh, uh, some you know, short piece found in the Vatican archives. Um, we have Lucretius. We have some discussions of Epicureanism by people hostile to Epicureanism, like Cicero or Plutarch. Um, and we have um, Philodemus, a, a few pieces by him. And it's, it's tougher to piece together a consistent philosophy of life out of that. But I know some people who are doing it. And I think that what they're doing, you know, I, I don't think it's bad. I just don't, I think it's rather incomplete. Um, I'd rather walk down a dark alley with an Epicureanism than a nihilist. You know? Uh so, yeah. Um, Knagelvi, uh, do you have any opinions on Alvin Planting? I heard William Lane Craig call him the modern Aquinas. And after laughing for a few minutes, I started to wonder if he's worth reading. Um, I will tell you, I've never, uh, you know, read a, a Craig book all the way through. I've paged through and not been impressed. Um, Plantinga, yeah, he's okay. He re he reinvents a lot of wheels in part because he he like a lot of analytic philosophers of religion uh, reads very selectively. Um, he, you know, he's got a few interesting things to say about the nature of Christian philosophy. Um, you'll see him mentioned in my in my book um, about the the 1930s Christian philosophy debates. But the people involved in that, which would be like you know Maurice Blondel, uh, Etienne Gilson, Jacques Maritain, Gabriel Marcel, Antonin de Sertiange, they were like light years ahead of planting or, or Craig. Um, I mean, is he the modern Aquinas? Definitely not. 
I mean, well, what do we mean by Aquinas? Pro somebody who's able to take all sorts of ideas and try to synthesize them into a grand integrated world perspective. Well, you kind of have to have a, a much wider exposure of ideas then, don't you? Um, so I don't, I don't see planting a, in that way. Um, Sharps asks, have you heard of Nick Land? And if so, do you have any thoughts of him? I think I've heard him mentioned, but I don't know anything about him. Um, so I, I don't have anything to say about him. Um, I suppose I, there's people are seconding and thirding the question on Nick Land. I suppose I should look him up and find out who he is. You know, this is, this is kind of an interesting side note. You know, the more time that you're spending with, with primary literature, because you only get 24 hours a day, and you got to spend some of that eating and sleeping and doing other stuff, um, the less time you have with reading, you know, contemporary stuff or, or secondary literature. So I don't, I don't really um, pay much attention to, to that sort of stuff. I'm, I'm not well read. Okay, here we go. So, okay, he's, he's uh, an English philosopher, short story, horror writer, father of accelerationism. Uh, as he's been tied with speculative realism. Um, he founded the Cybernetic Culture Research Unit. Yeah, I don't, I, don't, I don't really know enough about him to say anything here. Um, so I'm not sure what, it, what, what uh, accelerationism actually means. This is one of the problems with isms, right? Uh, people like to name things, and then you're like, okay, what, what actually is the context for this? Um, let's see here. Rel Lavi, do you think Plato meant the Republic to also be taken literally, or is it just a metaphor for the soul? The latter books convinced me he's being serious. Why not both? Why not more? I mean, it's not as if you have to take a book that's, you know, this thick and have just one single take on it. You could say some passages are supposed to be, you know, taken more seriously. Others are metaphors, like where, for example, Socrates says, here's a metaphor for you, <laughs> Um, maybe those things are, are metaphorical. I mean, the, the, the Republic covers a lot of stuff too. So I, I don't think that you have to have a one single global thing. Um, boy, here's, we got a lot more questions. So I think I'll stick around a little bit longer. Um, although I don't know, I'll get to all of these and let's see what we got here. Um, Mr. Dharam Paji, can a person make money through academia? And is it necessary to concrete your research interests and narrow it down? I'm studying philosophy, but wish to continue with sociology and psychology. Yeah, you can make money with academia. Um, it's tougher these days. Uh, there's a lot of competition for academic jobs in philosophy. For When I was still on the job market, every job I would apply for had about 500 applicants. Um, and... Uh, you know, we're, we're moving more and more here in the United States to relying on adjunct labor. I teach as an adjunct sometimes. And, and, and I do it because I like to stay in the classroom and it's nice to have access to university libraries. Um, but I'll tell you, if you try to make a living as an adjunct, that's a miserable way to, to, to exist. Um, and, and, and many people burn out doing so. Um, is it necessary to concretize your research interests? Yeah, I mean... Uh, if you want to write a dissertation, you do. Uh, you have to have a, you know, a topic. Um, but there's nothing that says that you can't have a wide range of interests. I mean, if you look at, you know, people are always saying, well, what do you do? Well, I work on figures all across the history of philosophy. And I also do other things on the side. Darkstar is a good question. What philosophers would you recommend to increase your understanding of power dynamics? Well, definitely... Lots of ancient philosophers, right? And, you know, uh, some of the medievals would be good, too, to think about as well. Um, and then, you know, you, you want to even read people that you might not necessarily agree with, but who, who have been incredibly important within the field, like, say, Thomas Hobbes. I, I don't agree with Hobbes on a lot of stuff, um, but I do work on Thomas Hobbes because I, I think that he's, he's important for setting problems. Um, and then you can go all the way through to the, the present. There's all sorts of interesting people, you know, uh, talking about power. Andrew writes, are you a poetry fan? Which poet do you find the most fertile for deep thought? Um, 
I mean, my favorite poet is Rilke, but that's because I find him to be very philosophical. <laughs> um, and I, I love I love the way he writes. Um, I, I'm not really a poetry fan. As a matter of fact, I'll, I'll admit something here. So when I'm reading like fantasy literature, which, you know, I do for that, like uh, worlds of speculative fiction, and people have, you know, like songs or poems woven into it, I often kind of skip through that stuff. You know, um, in part because I, I get kind of I, I get kind of bored with it. Um, I mean, good poetry is is really great, but there's there's so much stuff where you're like, eh, not really for me. Uh, Fleeben, which developing countries do you see leading the way in future philosophical thought and putting the most resources into academia? That's a great question. I don't know that I can really answer that well. Um. I can tell you just based on my own contacts and experience. So China, of course, right? China is a juggernaut, um, and they they understand the need to you know support study of, of things. So, um, but often what they do is you know very specialized. You know, like you're gonna do you're gonna study this, you know, and you're like, oh great, so I'm gonna just like work on Schopenhauer the rest of my life, and that's that's it for me, you know. Um, India is an interesting place. I, I do work um, developing resources and preparing candidates for the Indian civil service exam, which uh, has an ethics component. Um, and we're, when we're talking about civil service, we're talking about people moving up into the high ranks of civil service. Um, so they all have to pass this ethics, aptitude, and integrity exam. And I, I do you know prep for that. Um, and I also help people with the um, optional subject philosophy, which includes history of philosophy, Indian philosophy, social political philosophy, philosophy of religion. It's taken pretty seriously there. Um, the teaching, I don't know, is, is, is really that, that great. Um, Brazil is another interesting place as well. Um, you know, great disparities in, in, in income and wealth. There is kind of a commitment to teaching some philosophy. Um, and I think, you know, they're going to, they're, they're developing economy. Where else? It's a good question. I, I don't really know. I mean, I think Africa, as Africa develops, especially as Chinese money pours into it and resources is going to become a major growth area. And I'd like to see it be the right kind of growth, um, that actually benefits people. So, uh, Mr. Dharam, Dharam Paji, are you interested in both the analytic and continental traditions? Yeah, kind of interested in it. Um, I, I have done more. I've done work in, in, in both of them, you know, in talking about coursework and, and teaching and stuff like that. And, um, you know, um, I'm, I'm not, I don't belong to either. I don't have a dog in that fight. I do history of philosophy. I do philosophy as a way of life. Uh, I think neither analytic nor continental uh, exhausts what's available at the time. All right, let me go down. Uh, it seems philosophers are not taking care, good care of their bodies. Do you love to do some gym? Give me advice about how to use philosophy into doing gym or getting handsome. I can't tell you how to get handsome because I don't think of myself as somebody who's handsome. Uh, I can definitely say that, <laughs> uh, you know, I don't know about using philosophy into going to the gym. I'll tell you what I did. So I, I'm out of shape, you know, but I'm, I, I go to the gym, except I haven't for the last week and a half because I've been so sick. Um, you know, I've been going regularly and uh, improving, although I didn't actually gain any, lose any weight. I, I've actually gained weight since going because I've gained muscle mass. <laughs> so um, I haven't reached that peak where the muscles are going to start consuming, you know, enough calories. But I, you can see I'm losing fat, you know. Um, I do enjoy exercise. But it, it has to be done in the right way, and it's difficult to make the time for it. So what I had to do, I use Google Calendar to schedule my appointments and the work that I do during the day so I can keep track of all the, all the crap that I've got going on, right? And I found that if I didn't schedule exercise in there deliberately, like just like I would like a client you know, meeting or something like that, then I wouldn't get to it. I'd say, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll do it later on, you know, and then I'd be too tired or, you know, it, it's like midnight and I'm like, well, I'm not going to go down and work in the exercise room now, you know, because I got to go to sleep. 
Uh, I guess I'll just do it next week or tomorrow or something like that. But by putting it into my calendar and treating it as a priority, um, that gets me to do it. You know, um, other people find it very helpful to like, you know, have others involved in the process. I like to work out, you know, on, on my own in the gym and have everyone leave me the hell alone so I can do my workout. You know? But other people like to go to classes and stuff like that. So if, if that's what does it for you, I, I guess, you know, you don't have to have philosophy to do that, but you just figure out what, what will help you to actually go to the gym. I, I think that's, that's important. Um, all right, Canal, is Hegel showing a glimpse of his materialism when he says the spirit is a bone? He's criticizing vulgar materialism shown in phrenology and physiognomy when he says spirit is a bone. He's not endorsing spirit is a bone. He's saying that's part of the problem. Um, Connor, what are your thoughts, if any, on Jean, on Jean Baudrillard? I'm currently trying to write my philosophy dissertation on his notion of hyperreality. Baudrillard's an interesting guy. I, I like him. Um, he's easily misunderstood. Uh, in part because he didn't make a hell of a lot of effort to try to be properly understood. <laughs> but I, I, find, I find a lot of his ideas uh, quite interesting and, and well worth thinking out. You know, the notion of the hyper-real, um, the real is, the, you know, the re reproducible, all of that I think is, is, is pretty cool. Um, so, yeah, I think it's, it's, it's interesting that you're, you're working on him. Um, Ruby da Silva, can you give us your view of what the ancients might have said about the political correctness and its lunacy we're facing now? Sure. Aristotle would say that 90% of the people on the left and 90% of the people on the right are ignorant, uh, uh, often deliberately ignorant uh, people who are choosing their positions, misunderstanding justice, and should get the hell out of politics and, and, and keep their mouth shut when it comes to culture. That's paraphrasing, of course. Aristotle talks about the problem in, in, in political breakdown, what he calls stasis or faction, of um, people taking, you know, getting, getting things partly right and thinking that they've got the whole right and then demonizing their opponents. Um, Cicero also talks about this. Plato talks about this over and over again. You know, if, if we were to bring Aristotle into the present, he would, he would say that, you know, both of our two main political parties are, at this point, you know, very dysfunctional. Uh, don't don't serve the common good, um, and there are exceptions, but those are exceptions. So yeah. Hamilton thoughts on Nassim Taleb's stuff. Haven't read his stuff. Um, haven't been impressed with with uh, the way in which he comports himself, or the way that his fans do. Um, I've had to block some of them actually. Um, and so that doesn't give me, you know, much incentive to spend the bit of time that I have to, to read his stuff. So, um, Brian, I'm wondering whether or not you've encountered the work of, of, uh, Alan Badiou seems to be gaining quite a bit of attention in continental circles. Yeah, he, he has been for a long time. My wife actually uh, studied with him. Uh, and acted in his play <laughs> as, as one of the uh, Ahmeds. Um, I haven't read much of his stuff. Um, again, something I haven't had time for. But he's, he's you know, he's a very interesting figure. I wish I had the time to it. Um, all right, I'm just going to take a few more questions, and then i got to wrap up because I have another session I have to do in, in, in uh, less than an hour for the Heffer Hegel uh, uh, supporters. Uh, Thomas asks, I recall mentioning you used to lift weights. What type of training did you do, and what were your best lifts? Um, I did what was called endurance lifting back in the day. And the idea behind that was medium weights rather than heavy weights. Um, you know, medium amounts of, of reps and a lot of sets. So, for example, when I did the bench, I did a pyramid um, going – you know, pyramid means like you're going up in weights, 13 sets. Going up, ultimately, the highest I was at was like 175. Uh, and that would be like four reps. And then, you know, you'd go back down, right? And it took about an hour to do. Um, and, you know, I do the same thing for everything else. It was, it was uh, pretty intense when I would do that. And then I started doing a sort of circuit training using um, dumbbells at home. Uh, 
I just bought myself dumbbells, you know, and then I didn't do it for a very long time. And the reason why I did, you know, endurance uh, uh, training or, or, you know, stuff like that rather than powerlifting is my body's not built for that, you know. I, I don't have big, thick wrists like like some of my relatives do uh, who are, you know, I'm, I'm a big guy, but I'm, you know, I, I have a, and I have a wide frame, you know, broad shoulders, but I'm built for, um, for a different kind of stuff than powerlifting. I'm not, I don't have the bones to support that kind of stuff. Um, so, yeah. Oh, Ken, what's your opinion on the sci-fi works of Ian Banks? He seems to have taken particularly interesting views on the progression of society and uh, synthetic minds. Yeah, I, I got to read Banks. He was recommended to me by one of the participants in our, our Worlds of Speculative Fiction series that we do here locally. And boy, was it good stuff. I'm looking forward to reading more of, of the um, uh, culture series. And even some of his, his other stuff that's outside of that. So, all right, I'm going to take a few others. Um, Carl, do you have any thoughts on Xenophon Socratic Dialogues? I asked because you have no videos on them, and I want to read them alongside Plato's. Yeah, I mean, don't take my not having videos on something as, as a sign of whether I like it or don't like it. It's just a matter of finding time, you know. Um, and and uh, I, I think Xenophon is great. I really enjoy him. Um, he, he's, he's an interesting guy. Um, he's very important, uh, underrated in the importance for, for, uh, stoicism, I think, you know, remember who was Zeno reading, right? Xenophon. Um, and he asked about where can I find this, this guy? So, um, Xenophon is well worth, worth checking out. Um, ba, 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 ba. let me scroll down. A lot of uh, questions here. Um, I'm just going to grab a, a few that I can do really easy, and then I'm going to uh, bring it to a close. Um, uh, SJW Cuckerson, what do you think of the alt-right adopting some of Nietzsche's philosophical ideas? Well, everybody adopts some of Nietzsche's philosophical ideas. People on the left do, people on the right do. That's one of the things that happens when you become a famous philosopher. You're kind of screwed. You know, people are going to take your ideas and do weird stuff with them. Um, so I think it's, you know, when people get things wrong, as a philosopher, I'm like, well, that's not the, what Nietzsche actually said. But I, I don't think it's it's particularly the right who's who's doing that. I think a lot of people do that. Um, vintage watch guy, do you read any peer-reviewed philosophy journals? Not often, uh, not regularly. Um, I, I read articles from them, uh, but that's when I'm doing research on a particular topic. So if I'm like you know working on Aristotle and pro-racist, I'm looking at the articles that have to do with that sort of thing or or related topics. And they could be from all sorts of different journals. So, you know. Um, all right, Mr. Dharam Paji has asked twice, what's your opinion on champagne socialism or what we used to call Neiman Marxism, right? Uh, after Neiman Marxist, the Neiman Marcus, the the the, the Ritzy store. Um, you know, I think it's BS, right? I mean, I don't think that, that's, that's a very difficult topic. Um, if you're committed to socialism, but you're kind of, you know, living an elite life, you're not really committed to socialism. Um, and, and you might say, well, it enables me to, like, reach more people. Eh, I don't buy that crap. You know? <laughs> so um, as a matter of fact, I think it's better for the elites quite often to get the hell out of the way of those of us who want to do something. Um, rather than just taking up the, the forums and the space, you know. Um, so, uh, so, si, so, si, so, si, um, in your opinion, were there any Russian philosophers that had an influence on continental philosophy? Thanks for your advance. Yeah, I mean, um, there are some who actually like fit into continental philosophy. Lev Shestov, important guy, underrated, not, not looked at a lot. Um, 
you know, but but mentioned every once in a while. Boris Grice has a chapter on him in his anti-philosophy book. Um, Berdyaev did to some degree, um, mostly in terms of existentialism. Not a lot of people read him anymore. Um, of course, there's, you know, uh, Bakhtin, Mikhail Bakhtin, who's also Voloshinov, uh, as we think, um, done a lot of interesting stuff on, on language and, and dialogue and stuff like that. Um, so those are, those are three that are, that are quite important. Uh, Tony, best authors for understanding structuralism. That's interesting. So, uh, I mean, you definitely want to read De Saussure's course on general linguistics. Um, you'll probably find it kind of boring, <laughs> but it's worth reading. Uh, you want to check out Levi Strauss. You want to check out Roland Barthes, right? Um, and um, you can't avoid, if you really want to be serious about structuralism, reading A.J. Grimas, um, major author, uh, available in translation. You can also read them in the French if you want to. And um, somebody else, I think, who's, who's good to take a look at on that is Umberto Eco you know, the semi semiotics guy. He's got some great discussions about that. Um, let's see. I'll take one other question. Oh, I'll finish on this. Um, seven thinker. Do you think Ayn Rand, Ayn Rand had a good understanding of Aristotle? No. And I don't, I don't actually think that her followers do either. I think that, um, it's interesting because Aristotle's a good guy in her book, you know, and Plato, of course, is a bad guy. Um, and, but I, I don't think she really understood Aristotle, um, both in terms of his epistemology and in terms of his political theory and ethics. Um, and you don't go to Rand for good history of philosophy, uh, any more than you would to Bertrand Russell, who's terrible with history of philosophy as well, uh, or, or, you know, other, other contentious authors. Um, and it's interesting because her followers tend to like make Aristotle into a fetish, but those of us who are, you know, so you might say more Aristotelian, we look at that and we're like, wow, you, it's sort of like, it's sort of like take, seeing somebody take, you know, um, somebody who you love and lobotomize them, put some clown makeup on them and then sit them on their lap and make them say the things they want to say. That's what I would say uh, is, is the treatment of Aristotle there. So, all right, I'm going to say thanks to everybody. Um, great questions. I do have to get ready for, for another thing, and i got to eat something uh, before I, I do that as well. I'm glad I couldn't answer everything, but, you know, I try to give priority to first come, first serve, right? Um, so um, we'll do this again next month. We do this every month. Um, I'll also, you know, have the, the, um, what do we call them? Philosophy pop-ups here and on Facebook each month. Haven't decided what the topic is going to be for April, but I'll figure something out. Um, those of you who'd like to support my work, you can do so on Patreon. Uh, you just go to patreon.com slash Sadler. And, and if you want to do that, that's great. If not, um, th that's fine too. I'm glad that all of you tuned in. And uh, as usual, you've given me a lot to think about. I wish I had enough time to actually get to all of these things. Man, that, that, that's the one thing that we never can get enough of, right, is, is time. Or maybe I should do, maybe I'll talk about that for the philosophy pop-ups. That's a great idea, actually. I'm going to talk about time. Um, I'm seeing people still, still writing other stuff. All right, so I, I'm going to uh, bring this to a close and uh, see you in the interwebs somewhere else.